Hi, Ed. I'm delighted to talk with you today. Say more about why you agreed to this conversation. Jervis seduced me. <laughs> How did he do that? How did he do that? He convinced me that what we were all about way back when in the NTL days around the spirit of inquiry and nobody quite knew where this was all leading. And uh, trainers made a point of saying to their T group members, uh, not you, not me, know exactly what's going to happen here, and there's no prearranged agenda. We're entering the unknown. And I realized that when Jervis described, or when I read about dialogic OD, that's what that was talking about. And I then realized how much. I saw OD drifting toward what they call diagnostic OD, where we have pre-designed solutions and tools and proven methods. I hate that. This is a proven method. Uh, and I realize I no longer identify with that. Uh -huh. My work exposes me to that other reality that things are kind of unknown and I don't know where we're going to end up. I don't know how I'll be helpful, if at all. Uh, and that's, it seems to me, what Dialogic OD is trying to get across to the world. The world is increasingly that way. As someone who's been in this field for so long, how do you see Dialogic OD connected to some of the early traditions of our field? And Tell me a little bit about why those connections matter anyway. Well, the, his, the historical really starts with Kurt Lewin. I think psychology and sociology uh, were, were drifting, and we had a terrible time figuring out how something as horrible as Nazism could happen. Mm. And Kurt Lewin, I think, was very seminal in both the kind of research he did on, on leadership, authoritarian leadership versus democratic leadership, group dynamics, but even more so he stimulated a bunch of educators and psychologists, Lee Bradford and Ron Lippett and others, to try a whole different way of teaching training. So I think when that group invented the human relations labs that they started in Bethel in the 1940s and started this idea of the tea group, they were really rewriting the whole matter of teaching and learning. I think that's when experiential learning started around that rather interesting event where a bunch of researchers were discussing their observations of a group that they had been watching, when some of the group members wandered around and started to listen and started to say, but that's not what I saw happen. <laughs> and the researchers were smart enough to say, wait a minute, maybe their data as well, and maybe we need to incorporate them into the research process. So action research was born in that but even more so, it seemed to me, it suddenly became apparent that instead of teaching people how groups work, the T group says, let's be a group and figure out how we work, and discovered that that leads to much deeper, better learning. Tell us what you'd like Dialogic OD to become. To make any kind of predictions would be foolish. What would I want it to become? I think, as, as I've experienced the world, it's getting less and less predictable. So I think what I would want Dialogic OD to become is to be perceptually open to what the new challenges are going to be uh, 
and to broaden the base of the people in the dialogue, I think there is, there is a lot to be said for um, using dialogue as dialogue, not necessarily dialogic OD. Maybe that's why I'm hesitating here. I don't know about dialogic OD because I don't know about OD. I don't know where it's going or should be going. But dialogue as a method for e exploring, I think, has this incredible potential of bringing different pieces of reality together that, that we should exploit. So maybe we should even drop the OD label and just talk about dialogic inquiry as an important piece of where, where the world needs to go. And so why not say dialogic OD itself is, is a generative metaphor that should, should stay ambiguous? Why, why try to pin it down? If it generates different ideas and different people, that's exactly what it should do. And I think I chose to say that because I'm, the authors are all there, and I do want to warn them that some of them sounded like they were zealots rather than explorers. <laughs> so Ed, what concerns do you have about Dialogic OD? When I talked to, to Jervis or Bob Marshak, I, I experienced their own inquiry and their desire to open things up and explore, as we did in the old T-group days. When I read some of the articles in the book that's coming out, I had a little bit of a nervous feeling that, that some of the authors and I can't tell you names, it's a feeling. We're already saying, okay, here's how we do it. And the minute, here's how we do it, that's when I think we begin to run the risk of coming to believe too much in ourselves mm -hmm. and not staying open to what might happen. This happens, for example, in the culture field where the, the social constructionists who identify with the dialogic really want to say culture is forever forming in, in the conversation, in the dialogue, <clears throat> and therefore that's how you should define culture. <clears throat> and I have to say, well, wait a minute, that is a way of defining how culture works. But it's utter nonsense if you say that is the way to think about culture because there are all kinds of things that are quite stable that don't change with every conversation uh, that, that we can't ignore as being what culture is in another sense. So I use the, the again, the human body as the analogy uh, we know that the human body is changing all the time, at least our thoughts are changing all the time, but that doesn't disqualify the skeleton from being a kind of a stable part that keeps other parts together. Mm -hmm. And the skeleton changes, oh yes, it changes, but very slowly, <laughs> whereas our thoughts change constantly. So I find the social constructionist point of view of dialogue as being fine as a way of thinking about conversations. But the minute you say, and that's how we should analyze culture, you've gone into what seems to me to be nonsense. What, what message do you want to send to those people? A mix, I'm sure, of academics and practitioners. That's a great question because it's, it's also a dangerous one because it's so easy to seduce me into the telling mode. Into the prescription. <laughs> Here's the prescription. So 
what would I uh, say if, if I really had to say something? If you had to, yeah, yeah. I, I think the key is the discovery what dialogue does for us, which opens us up more. We hear more and we see more in dialogic activities than in discussions or other kinds of group activities. And so I see dialogue as a kind of group into which I like to go because I might learn something new. And I would like to believe that, that it's that spirit of inquiry of wanting to learn something new, exposing myself deliberately to something that, that might be stimulating or fun that is the key to how to practice dialogic OD is, is see whether, whether the interaction with the client will lead to some new ideas. And uh, it reminds you of that wonderful ad for one of the beers where this wonderful a uh, macho, handsome man surrounded by beautiful women. Uh, he's, a, he's an interesting man and he drinks this particular kind of beer and the last line is always, stay thirsty, my friends. So my equivalent of that would be, stay open, my friends. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. I think that's a wrap. <laughs> I think that's a great finish. Ed.